Welcome to another edition of the 1% Better Podcast with your host, Rob O'Donoghue. Hello there. Welcome to this week's 1% Better. It's Friday. It's 1% Better mostly on a Friday, but when it's not, uh, it's probably because there's so much going on, it's hard to keep up. But thankfully, over the last while, I've been managing to get content out. If it's not 1% Better, it might be an episode of me, myself and EI or one of our book club interviews or episodes or I don't know what we call them, but the book club. And they're going quite well. The next one of those is next Tuesday. with Susan Manning going to be talking about Atomic Habits. Looking forward to the live show, uh, the live interview recording summary and then putting it out afterwards. So if you're interested, go to the webpage, the website, robertagreen.ie or just look up anything on Twitter and you'll find a link to register for the book club You'll have uh, probably an hour on the night to listen to us talk and Susan talk about Atomic Habits and ask some questions. And it's going down really well. It's actually beginning to get a bit more momentum, which is always good. These things take a bit of time to get going. This week's 1% Better is about teams. And there's an awful lot of importance in teams, be it sport, business, life. And different types of teams exist. This one is all about the loyalist team It's from three ladies who authored the book called The Loyalist Team, Audrey Epstein, Linda Adams and Rebecca Teasdale. And they are the founding partners of the Trispective group and co-authors of this book. Interview them sometime in middle to late February. I know that's a while back now. A lot has happened in the world since then. The whole COVID pandemic was kicking off in earnest around then. And we were talking about how it was going to change people's lives and how teams would be different certainly virtually so some maybe interesting stuff in there and when we recorded it we didn't know what was fully ahead of us but I think it still is very much relevant the three ladies were brilliant to share their time brilliant to share their journeys we got a bit of background on all of them insights talking about leadership the different types of teams be it loyalist or a saboteur team is another type and the tools and practices and exercises that they recommend can be very, very useful as you look at your own team, as you as a leader looks at your team or within a team, you can certainly uh, take a lot from this one. So there you go. This one is one I've been waiting to put out for a while, probably a little bit later than usual, the time it'll come out on Friday, but I hope you enjoy it. As always, get in touch if you have any suggestions and hopefully I'll keep going with the one a week. Maybe over the next few weeks, there might be a couple of gaps but you do have 170 or odd other ones to check out and we will endeavor, as in me, I'll endeavor to keep content coming your way and hopefully it's of value. Thanks for everything. Thanks for your feedback. Thanks for getting in touch. And as always, thanks for listening. Enjoy and good luck. Hey folks, welcome to another episode of 1% Better and this one is a, a first for the, the podcast. Um, it is the first time I've in, I'm interviewing three people on the other side of, of the virtual desk, uh, three ladies, all three in Colorado. Um, so I'd like to welcome Audrey Epstein, Lynn Adams and Rebecca Teasdale to the show. Thanks a lot. Hello. Great to be Thank here. You. Very good to talk to you all on this uh, Friday afternoon and i'm really looking forward to uh to learning a little bit about um each of you and and the work you do and and certainly diving into the book uh that you've put out the loyalist team um because i'm fascinated about teams and i think in this current uh, climate which um we're living through how how teams can can effectively work together in this very much remote uh world that we're facing into so maybe there's a there's a new uh, version of this book to come out with a virtual angle <laughs> in the near future um a new chapter perhaps anyway so 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 great to have you all along so maybe i'll I'll go to each of you just for a quick intro maybe linda first if you want to let us know a bit about you and i suppose your your passions in, in the work you do sure um so i've been an hr professional my career um for those of you who may have picked up on the accent originally from glasgow in scotland um, and my first job out of University of St. Andrews was with Ford Motor Company in Ford of Europe. And I uh, moved from there to the US where I've worked for companies like PepsiCo 
um, Hardy's Food Systems, which is a hamburger chain. And then my last corporate gig was with Level 3 Communications, which uh, is a high-tech telecommunications company. Um, and my time there had an opportunity that was really very unique in that I joined the company as a startup. Um, now, certainly a $14 billion startup, so definitely unique in that regard, but had a chance to grow an HR function globally from the ground up. Um, and really just uh, so appreciative of that opportunity and an opportunity to see what it meant to build a leadership organization um, really um, from a few hundred people to several thousand all around the world. Um, and for those of you who know much about the dot-com environment, uh, what eventually happened uh, was the, the boom-bust cycle. And we went through a period of pretty significant layoffs uh, that really took me to a place where I, I, I literally couldn't deal with it anymore. It was um, a place where I had gone to build something and create opportunity. And here I was, not quite every month, but close to the third Thursday of every month, laying people off. And so um, I left, and I left really not sure what I was going to do, um, but had an opportunity to go into this area of leadership and team development um, did that for a couple of years and found out that I loved it. Um, it was for me everything about the positive aspects of HR and you know none of the none of the more negative pieces. I haven't laid anyone off in 14 years. I haven't looked at a 401k benefits plan in four years. Um, I haven't had to deal with unions in four years. Um, so all, all the things that are definitely more challenging in the HR environment um, have have been set aside and it's now about helping leaders and teams and organizations really lean into their full potential and 12 years ago I had the opportunity with my partners Audrey and Rebecca to found the Trispective group and I, I get to do the work I love to do with people I absolutely love to do it with so there's no better place for me to be than the work I'm doing right now. Very interesting and just to pick up on the that laying off piece, I've had to do that in my career uh, as well. And I think when, I don't know, if, if you know your values and you know what, what, what I suppose motivates and drives you and that probably never is, is somebody's value, but it's it's so soul-destroying and draining that um, the only option in some instances is to, is to walk away from that, I, I guess. Yeah, the, 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 the one piece in all of that, um, and it was a long time, it's probably two and a half, three years that we were in this cycle. The one pride, piece of pride I have in all of that is how we handled those layoffs. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think the way we can measure that we handled it in, in the best way possible is I believe there wasn't a single person that we laid off that we eventually went back to as things were getting better to whom we offered a job and they didn't take it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I, I think we handled it from a values perspective, just in, in, in the best way possible and the right way. Um, but to your point, it was exhausting and it was, it was, it was eating at my soul and that was you know, what I just couldn't take anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's just interesting when we talk about coaching, do coaching a lot myself. And sometimes you talk to people, coaches about, running towards something or running away from something and yeah. it, sometimes it's it's okay to do a bit of both or or to run away you know I think it's not, it's oh I, I i ran away i i left there not knowing what i was going to do yeah. i just knew i couldn't do that anymore okay very good can i add something to that absolutely this is audrey yeah. <laughs> um i i do think that sometimes uh successful leaders fear giving up on something that they should give up on because it feels like failure. And everything within every part of their being, the fiber in their soul says, I can overcome this. And in coaching, I've had to coach a lot of leaders to say, do you want to? Is this a situation that actually is positive for you? that is giving benefits? Do you really want to work for a boss who disrespects you long term, just because you're not going to let him or her challenge you in that way or win? And I think that knowing what you're for versus what you're against, understanding your purpose and your values is so important in those situations. Mm -hmm. And the word want to is, is key because you get either have to or want to 
or get to do something. And that's right. And sometimes if you want to do it, you might want to do that a couple of times to learn how to deal with the emotions of it. But maybe when you kind of have to keep having to do it, it's where the draining probably comes in more. So, so, so Audrey, why don't you go into a little bit about yourself now that we've uh, sure. heard from you? Great. Well, I started my career in the educational nonprofit world and then moved on to uh, corporate develop corporate world of uh, development. I've run um, leadership and team and, and organizational development functions, and um, mainly in the high tech world. But I have always just been passionate about the human side of business or organizations. I believe in the power of people to go beyond their personal expectations or stories about their limitations. And I love working with folks to help them um, figure out, like, how, how can I be the best leader I can be? How do I show up for others in a way that's going to um, compel them to be at their best? Um, how how do I develop teams? That's all I've ever worked on in my entire career. I feel lucky almost every single day to um, be honored to get, you know, people let me into their lives. Um, they share their stories with me. Um, I get to work with these amazing teams who are just trying to figure out how do we take the collective potential and make it more. Um, it's pretty exciting. And Today, um, it's so interesting how team tendencies are showing up. I'm sure we'll get into this later, but I feel like for folks who have really invested in building high trust relationships, like a set of norms for how we're, what our expectations are for each other and respect, it's so useful right now when everyone's feeling isolated and for teams that don't have that, it's just exacerbated. So um, I feel really grateful for all the good work I've gotten to do with teams and leaders prior to this crisis to invest in what's going to really make a difference now that we find ourselves in this mess. Very uh, interesting stuff there. And I'm, I'm picking up on a kind of a consistent theme between both of you so far that I might ask a question on when I hear from Rebecca. Um, Rebecca, do you want to give a quick intro as well? Sure. So before uh, our careers intersected 20 years ago in the, the high tech world that Linda was talking about, I had um, been in consulting. I was with Accenture and uh, other high tech companies. And, um, you know, my, my own journey was interesting because I, like so many of the clients I work with, I went through my earlier career days convinced that the most important thing for me was to, to be smart and to have the best ideas and to show how smart I was in my decisions. And that's what I kind of competed on to get ahead. And then as my own journey kind of evolved in those, those pivotal days where we all worked together and I was all of a sudden in charge of leadership development at a, or development at a global organization. And I started working um, with other very, very bright young people who had been brought into this company in the high tech realm. Um, it gave me, you know, a, a, a six year opportunity to look at what really differentiated good leaders, where people struggled, what enabled people to drive engagement, et cetera. And then as we all left that corporate setting into our own consulting firm 12 years ago, I had this opportunity to really share these just, I guess, profound learnings that I had had about what matters from a leadership perspective. And now to have really found my true calling to where I can help people and help people really question their own stories, their own, uh, you know, challenges that keep them stuck from a leadership perspective. Um, I really wished I had had the benefit of coaching earlier in my career. Um, but now we're just all three in this wonderful situation where we get to do the work we love every day. Mm. Yeah, no, it's, uh, I'm laughing because your your story and it just resonates and connects in similar kind of trying to, you know, chase promotions, chase success in your, in my career till, till I got to a point where I kind of started to figure my own st stuff out better and, and tap into the, I suppose, 
what I really wanted to do in life. And, and I think each of you have talked about helping people, helping and serving leaders. That That's kind of what motivates you. Maybe each of you, where where does that come from? Have you reflected on that as a as a trait or something that that's deep inside of you and and what what the origins of that maybe interest or value is maybe maybe rebecca first is does that where does that passion come from do you think for wanting to help people um that that's such a good question um of course the easy answer is we do lots and lots of personality assessments we've done every version out there and um you know i am i guess hardwired in this way that i'm kind of naturally um, a helper. I've, um, I've always been very in tune with, you know, harmony and helping people and under seeing and sensing when people are struggling or when people are, it's just that empathy piece that I have. Um, certainly there had to be an upbringing part of that. Um, my father was a clinical psychologist and my mom was a teacher. So I think some of that was just embedded in the DNA, not the literal, but the kind of, you know, collective, vibe of my family. Um, but I, and I think I didn't know that that was really how I was wired earlier in my career. And it took my journey through my journey. I've gotten to that piece of authentic understanding about who I am that I'm like, Oh wow, this is what I'm supposed to do. And, um, you know, to, to go back to Jim Collins, when you can find this overlap between what you're kind of meant to do, what you love to do, and what you can make a living at is really an ideal place to find yourself in. Mm, very good. And, and Audrey, so similar background, what, what's your... Uh... Yeah, I think different. Um, I, I think I came to this view of helping others more through a political lens. I see education as a great like democratizing force in the world. And it's the only way that people can rise up. I think early in my life, I sort of had an angrier lens (laughs) around politics where I was more shouting in the streets about injustice. And, um, you know, through maturity, I actually started to think, oh, reaching out and helping people to, be their best selves, live their values, connect one-on-one, help people see that you can be a, like a strong leader and not be, um, I don't, you know, not put people down, um, push down their needs, uh, really appeal to me. So I think I, I came to mine in a, in a totally different way than Rebecca's. Mm. So were you doing, was there a bit of activism in your earlier days when you were on the streets beating things down? Did you <laughs> there, there was, I had, I, I, I was definitely active when I was young and uh, was in a sit-in in college and I still, um, yeah, we don't have to get into politics no, no, here, no. but I still feel very, <laughs> very strongly about my political views, especially right now in the United States. Sure. No, the reason I ask, because the epi- I released a podcast today with a gentleman called Peter Kalmus, and he's a climate, cli- he, he works for NASA, he's a climate change expert, and he's a climate activist as well. So I was just picking up on the activism in him, and uh, you kind of just triggered it there, but uh no, that's interesting. And just to to finish that around, um, Lynn, did you your your story? Where does that fit in there? Yeah, it's it's um, I'm I'm surprised by the question actually, um, because I don't think I've ever been asked that in that's all good. in all the years that interviews that I've done, um, and I I don't have a particularly deep answer. I'll go back to um between my my third and fourth years at uni, um, over that that uh, summer, my dad was a works manager. And they were closing down the factory that he ran in South Wales and moving the operation up to Glenrothes in Scotland. And he didn't have anyone that he could work with in helping manage through that plant closure. And so he asked me to really kind of be be his assistant, I guess, in, in pulling together all of that together. And I watched, as I watched it come through, um, and I had been studying economics and industrial relations at St. Andrews. Um, I, I was like, I, I really want to be managing things from a big picture perspective, making sure we do the right things for people. I don't want to go down the operations manufacturing route that my dad had. Um, so let's try industrial relations. 
And that was what I focused on in my senior year. And that was what took me to Ford. Mm. Yeah, that's a, it's a, a good answer from the perspective of how you've reflected on it, I suppose, as well. And uh, makes makes total sense. It's beautiful to see the different perspectives, how you all get to where you get to um, in uh, through life's journey. So, no, thanks for sharing that, guys. So the the, the reason, I suppose, we started this conversation, I, I reached out to Audrey probably six months ago um, when I was writing a piece around self-awareness for for leaders. And I, I kind of came up with this idea of a, a chief awareness officer, like a CAO from that perspective. And uh, I wanted to, to pick your brain around how leaders can develop self-awareness and how they can develop self-awareness in, in their teams. So maybe maybe talk a little bit about, you know, the importance of self-awareness in the in the work that you guys have done and and we can maybe go into more in, in around the, the team environment from there. Self-awareness is the core of everything as a leader and as a human being. And it is a journey that we are on for our whole lives. So you never get there. I, I don't know, maybe the Buddha, but like we don't suddenly get enlightenment and become self-aware. It takes a lot of work and effort, both internally. And then I think the most difficult and courageous part of self-awareness is ensuring that others view of you matches how you perceive yourself. So we know from research that our ability to be self-aware is very challenged. And most of us um, are not very self-aware, meaning, you know, so it can mean a number of things. Either we don't understand what's really happening inside. We haven't taken the opportunity to see what's really driving and motivating us. How are we really coming across to others? Um, Do our actions and our intentions truly match? Um, or we we haven't we think we know but we haven't gone to others to say hey tell me about how i'm showing up in this situation tell me about what it's like to work for me as a leader and so to me that's this this huge link between having what we call a loyalist team a true high performing team and a, and a leader or any team member self-awareness is that you have these team members who you trust so much where you don't have to put on a false face. You can really be yourself and they will tell you, they will give you feedback. They will help you to understand when you're at your best and when you have showed up in a way that they know is not who you are at your core. Um, you know, my my silly way of, of saying it is like if I had spinach between my two front teeth all day long and I didn't know it until I went to the bathroom mirror and I had talked to 20 people, like why wouldn't they give me that awareness? Why wouldn't someone say, fix your teeth? But we we do this all day long and others don't tell us like, hey, you interrupted me five times in that meeting or hey. I don't think you meant to come across this way to to the folks over in IT, but let me tell you, it sounded pretty disrespectful. I think you should go and fix that. That's how we build self-awareness. Mm-hmm. And working with leaders you have the experience to have worked with, to your point, a lot of us think we're self-aware, but the percentages that actually are are, are a lot lower. How do you approach a leader that thinks they are so so self-aware and um, you're, it's obvious that they, they're not, that you can see it, that their team are afraid to uh, maybe approach that subject. What are the things that can, can work to kind of break that down? Um, maybe, yeah, Linda, you can go for that one. I was going to say the key to opening that up is that there has to be a measure of curiosity um, on, on the part of that, that leader, that executive, uh, because if there's zero curiosity, if they're a hundred percent convinced that they are totally self-aware and completely enlightened, um, it's really difficult to begin any conversation with them. Um, and, and often what I do in those situations is, um, ask someone to, to, to look in the mirror or to look at me and to hold up their right hand. And as their mirror, I hold up the hand that would reflect and what it shows is I'm holding up my left hand 
and saying that's what um, that self-reflection, that image you have of yourself is not the image other people have of you. And that simple exercise sometimes is enough for people to say, oh, wait, maybe maybe I, I, I'm not as self-aware as I thought I might be. But without that curiosity, the door can't even open. Creating that curiosity is, is a big first step in being able to engage with someone as a coach. Can, can I just add on to that? So, um, you know, just from a more tactical view, one, we always, always use data to bridge this gap. And um, it's very hard to argue with other people's perceptions. But when we get 360 data or inter- we often do interviews with stakeholders of uh, a leader to really get an honest and candid view of how this leader may be impacting someone. And when we can bring that back and say, we know you you probably don't intend to come across this way, but let's look at the perceptions you're creating around your motives, your intentions, et cetera. And then look at, do those, do those views and perceptions about you serve you well? Are you, do you have the brand you want to have as a leader? Go ahead, Audrey. Yeah, I just wanted to add in, we've also found data to be invaluable in doing team sessions, because what we found is that in our interviews, we would talk to individuals about the team and the team leader prior to the session, and they would be very honest with us because it's easy to be courageous anonymously, um, not in front of your boss. But then we would get into the team session and looking at their boss or looking across at their teammates, they'd be like, no, trust is fine. No, no, we're pretty good. Everything's pretty good. And um, so, as Rebecca said, we love to use data with leaders. We also like to use data with teams. We have a team assessment that we now use. And in our team assessment, you see in black and white how folks are feeling about the trust and relationships in the team, the way that that the team leader either encourages team support or accountability or holds people accountable for the right behaviors, et cetera. And in that way, it, it enables a different level of candor that can be a game changer. And so sometimes self-awareness is not pretty and it's not easy And it takes a jolt in order for leaders to become self-aware. In fact, I've seen many leaders who, until they've had their first failure, are not willing to engage in self-awareness because they're just riding that wave and they think they're infallible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can definitely, uh, a few leaders jump into mind when uh, when you (laughs) mention that for sure. So self-awareness is a core part of, I guess, of a, of a strong team, of a loyalist team. The idea for the book, I'd like to maybe just ask you, how did you come up with this idea for the loyalist team? How, how did it kind of present itself um, just in general? Where did that come from? We really do believe we have an approach and an understanding of what creates real value for teams and organizations. And we have this passionate belief that everybody deserves a great team and as as good as the three of us are there's only so much reach the three of us can have Um, and we feel that we've developed an approach in a way that is accessible um, is um, and can be operationalized and so from that we decided to the best way for us to extend our reach was to write the book and when we came together, uh, we, we felt very strongly that we had all kinds of stories that we could share uh, that talk about the four different team types because we've experienced all four team types. Um, sometimes we've experienced it personally in our corporate lives and other times um, most certainly we've experienced it across the board with the teams that we've worked with. And we thought we could help provide that level of insight and self-awareness through the book and expand our reach by getting the book out there. I was just going to say, and the way we developed the model itself is that um, in working with hundreds of teams within our corporate world, um, in once we formed our own company, we we wanted to give people a way to have a common language around the team types that they were experiencing. And 
recognized that um, we saw different levels of like teamwork and accountability and candor and um, results in teams. And so we played around with different versions of this model uh, (laughs) with different titles. We had three different types of teams. We had four different types of teams. And then we started testing it. And so we uh, we developed this assessment. We tested hundreds upon hundreds of teams. Um, I think we've probably done, I don't know, eight or nine hundred assessments at this point, and uh, you know, validated that there were these four team types that existed in every team um, that we had come across, and that the value in labeling it was giving teams a starting point. So we recognized that just like in a business context, you would never come up with a business plan or a new product roadmap without understanding the current state. And yet we found so many teams, they had no idea where they stood today. And all they want to do is go on an offsite We'll do like, you know, a ropes course or some paintball and we'll fix things. But unless you can talk about where we are now, how do you know what to do? So that that's why we came up with a model. Mm-hmm. When you started the group 14 years ago, your, your organization, you probably weren't planning to write a book about teams 12 years later, right? So how did the did that topic, that focus emerge over time? When did it kind of present? Was there like an aha moment when you all realized, wow, there's such obvious need to kind of hone in on teams here as opposed to, you know, leadership traits or, or, or whatever the other topics was. I'm interested to see where that kind of came from, the emergence of the idea. Yeah, there, there, um, there's been, there had been so much focus on leadership up to that point through the 80s and 90s and what makes a good leader. But a, a leader in a suboptimal team it only has so much potential and uh, effectiveness and what we saw and what we really came to terms with in working with people is that the way people show up on a team impacts how other people perform um do are people set up to do their very best work are they set up to have high confidence um where they can perform can they do they feel like it's okay to make mistakes a certain like what we really d- delved into is what behaviors and dynamics have to be at play on a team for people to be able to do their very best work, um, and that is a very uh, it's a, it's something you can observe, and when you can observe it, you can start to replicate it in other teams. And so, a great leader alone without a good team is going to be. Uh, suboptimized in in any number of ways. And so we just saw that need and people at that point had never really considered, wow, the way I show up does really have an impact on the people around me for the good, for the indifferent, or for the better. So so just to add to that, if I may, because Audrey and Rebecca have both talked about the importance of data in our work. Uh, As we started to really mine the data that we had from the hundreds of teams that we have evaluated, we found that the percent variance attributable to a team leader in moving a team from poor performing, from from saboteur or toxic, to high performing, to loyalist, is around 15%. If you're able to fully engage the whole team, the percent variance attributable to the team effort in moving the team from saboteur to loyalist is 70%. And, and as an HR practitioner, I kind of smacked my forehead and it was like, oh, you know, all, all of those the years that I've, as a leader, have been investing in having other leaders excel. To, to Rebecca's point, if you have a great leader but a suboptimal team, that's not going to release the most value or create the best team if you don't engage the whole team. Mm-hmm. Interesting. And and to, to just build on that, you've mentioned data a lot in how you put the book together, the findings to create the different teams. Where does intuition and and kind of gut come into this t- this discussion when you become a a loyalist team? Like you're you're using a lot of data, but how much of that is feeling as well? Feeling if you're a team member, is that what a, you're a asking? A team or? member or, or or the the leadership? Like 
I suppose it's kind of tapping more into maybe the the emotional intelligence within the team as well. How important is that? What have you found that are the key traits within that kind of framework in in loyalist teams? So we we generally go through an exercise with teams where we ask them to um, to imagine the best team that they were ever on, um, to talk about the attributes of 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 that team and what made it so special for them and then we just you know brainstorm that list pull it all together and people talk about um, um, trust feeling each other's have their backs having shared goals around winning and losing together around having fun around achieving more than they ever thought they might achieve and and as we build out that list with them um, that list really reflects what you would want in a loyalist team and, and so for your listeners, I'd encourage them to think about what was the best team you were ever on and what made it your best team. And, and again, what we found in our work, sometimes there's a sadness in that people have to go back to high school to think about their best team. And they may be in their 40s or 50s. Um, you know, for some people, it's college. Um, for some people, it's a, it's a sports experience. Um, but what we want is for everyone to be able to have that great team experience, however or wherever they experienced it, and have it be the experience they have today. The other thing I would say is that teams are only as strong as the weakest link between any two people on the team. Every single relationship on a team matters and has to be strong. And that to me um, is really a lot of, I don't know, heart work as much as, you know, intellectual work. Um, Because, you know, it is sometimes tough for us to connect with our peers on a team where we are naturally oftentimes in a competitive um, element with them, or we are competing for promotions or resources or the best project work. And so a leader really has to see like what's happening between my team members. Um, Are they collaborating or are they competing in an unhealthy way? Do they support each other to key stakeholders? Do they represent um, the good of the team or themselves? Do they subjugate their personal needs and agenda for the good of the team or not? And if a leader can't recognize what, like, what's underlying, where are the tensions, where's the conflict, what do we need to talk about, what are the elephants on the table that no one's willing to bring up? That is the toughest part, I think, of a, of a leadership role. Um, it's sometimes the toughest part of being a team member and maybe the most important. Mm-hmm. And on that, though, how does a leader make that become a norm within the team? Or, or I, I guess, what are the, the tactics that they can put into place to, to kind of get that moving so that everybody is... Uh, you know, talking openly and, and co- becoming more cohesive. Just interested in some of the, the tools you've identified that help there. So one thing we do with teams, so in, in the, the sessions we run with teams initially, we let them practice those behaviors and we set up a safe environment where they can be candid. Um, we always try to put um, something in place where the it, around the importance of having, um, assuming positive intent, because you can hear almost anything from a peer if you believe they have your best interest in mind. And when you can go into a meeting and establish what I'm going to say is for the good of the team or for you, that's a starting point. But we really always try to work towards coming up with some agreements or team norms that um, people can measure themselves against. And um, it's always based on the current reality of the team. So maybe you're struggling with candor or you're struggling with let's not have the meeting after the meeting. Uh, um, but have the real conversations in the room. You, you you make agreements and have the team responsible for developing those agreements. And then once you have some agreements, you're not, you're not, uh, you know, playing by a secret set of rules. You can talk about them, you can measure them, you can use that as a way to learn so that the team can start to self-manage around those very important issues that could be holding them back. 
So, Rob, you raised the, the question earlier about self-awareness, um, and this is definitely one place where self-awareness for the leader has to come into play. Um, mostly, no, no, I won't say most leaders, many leaders, and sometimes really good leaders, operate from what we call a hub-and-spoke perspective, where they're at the centre of the wheel and individual members of the team are at the end of those spokes. Um, and that can drive a lot of value, um, certainly create insight and clarity for the leader around what's happening on the team. But it's not creating those points of interconnection with the team that all of a number of which Audrey talked about um, that are really important for a team to be in that place where they're a loyalist team. And so having the leader step back from being the at the hub, having the leader step back from being the point of accountability and having an expectation set for both the leader and the team that the whole team needs to engage is a, a very important first step in, in getting everyone involved in moving towards a loyalist team. And one thing that we realized in working with teams is that no one, almost no one has this clear definition of what a high performing team is. What they have is their years and years of experience working on mediocre or poor teams. They bring that forward as their expectations. So if you don't get the team together and clarify, what do we expect of each other? You're going to have like a whole set of missed um, opportunities and expectations and hurt feelings. So is it my responsibility to tell you if I think you're making the wrong move? Or is it my responsibility to put my hands up and say, well, that's that's your area. I don't have anything to, to do with it. Is it my responsibility to bring up a tough issue in the meeting? Or am I supposed to just preserve harmony? We, we all come in with this baggage around what we should do. And unless we, we clarify, what will we do based on who we want to be and the value we want to create for the organization, we're going to miss it every time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and that just triggers off something very interesting that I wanted to ask. A few years ago, when I took over a team after the merger, I mentioned the morale was very low. Um, and there was uncertainty. So what we did was we, we kind of had a, a baselining of uh, where we're at as a team right now and set, a, set out a course of uh, action, some values that we wanted to live towards. And then every quarter, at the end of the quarter, we, we kind of got everybody to maybe measure where we're at as a team now against those values. It was a little bit subjective, but it was giving us a point in time of we might have scored 3 out of 10 at the start. Now we were 5 out of 10 and we were going in the right direction. How do you, what tools or, or approaches have you looked at trying to measure your team uh, coming, you know, going from a saboteur team to a loyalist team and how regularly would you have the team kind of check in and is it is it very subjective? Is there objectivity in there? Um, Rebecca or Linda, any, any thoughts on that one? So, um, yes, we have a tool um, that we've developed. Uh, it's a proprietary tool. It's called the Four Team Zone Assessment. Um, we developed it about eight years ago, and, and Audrey talked about uh, testing um, to make sure that the, the test is both reliable and valid. Um, and that's the assessment that we've referred to in, in assessing upwards of 800-odd teams. Um, it is based, um, has a fairly strong academic base in terms of the elements that create high performance um, and, and certainly shaded to some extent by our own experiences of, of what high performance looks like. But that gives us a place where every team engagement that we go into, we conduct that team assessment um, and it's it's certainly something that that anyone could research on our our, our website trispectivegroup.com. Uh, the the assessment gives us a place to really be able to identify what are the two or three clear opportunities that this team owns, and we use that assessment to create a team development plan. It's uh it can be used as a team three hundred and sixty, uh, in the same way an individual three hundred and sixty might work. So the team has a development plan coming out of that first session. We can create pulse points or pulse checks from that first session, but we would generally retest after six months and do the full assessment. Um, so it, it is it 
in, in our opinion and, and certainly from our research, it's a very objective test as to where teams stand. And what we've used the test to do is, is, is the assessment to is help us establish in which of the four team zones a team stands. And we've been able to um, identify and and do work around a a team that's coming in at the lowest level, at a saboteur or toxic level, with six months of intentional work and a clear roadmap. They can move up to that situational loyalist or or good, not great level um, in that six-month period. Very good. Yeah, that was another question I was going to ask. What What is the time frame? Like any coaching engagement, if you're doing a one-to-one coaching, you know, change takes time, behaviors take time to be embedded. Um, and you're saying maybe f- over a period of six months or so, you kind of give them. What, what, what then, even if after the six months and the team goes to situational or even up to loyalist, how do they maintain at that level? How do, do they keep that going? What sort of support do they need to... Um, to stay there because I presume people can fall back into to bad habits. It, it, indeed. And if, they, if, if where they get to is that situational loyalist or good, not great team, that's a very tricky place to be because it takes just one significant change, either the loss of the team leader, a loss of a key player, a change in the market, and that team's going to slip, slip back. Um, so it, it, it's... The, the team journey is like a personal journey. There's always room for improvement and growth. And when things get to be in a place where you have that loyalist team, it is something you want to hold on to. And the challenge there is what is the opportunity for us to continue to stay at this level? Because teams don't stay together forever. There's going to be changes. Um, so consistently having those conversations about where do we need to improve? Um, what work do we still need to do? Uh, we find that the best work that we do is generally done in partnership with HR business partners or senior executives who are prepared to continue the conversation when we're not there. So we, we're, we really are about teaching a man to fish. Um, so we partner as best we can, but looking to create that capability and capacity to to continue to manage uh, when we're not there. I, I think the one of the best teams I've ever worked with is um, an a, executive um, team of a um, a whole slew of ski resorts across the world, and they what they put in place is a never rest on our laurels and never fully satisfied attitude. Um, So although they became a loyalist team through a lot of hard work, um, a lot of tough conversations, a whole lot of support, um, a lot of building of trust and working to assume positive intent with each other, I, I would say it's maybe the only executive team that I've ever seen where truly they never talked bad about each other behind each other's back to anyone else in the company. There were no, they really worked hard to get rid of the silos that exist. So it wasn't like, well, this is good for marketing and bad for operations. So as the head of marketing, I'm going to do this. They really took an enterprise. They really, really took an enterprise view. Um, And I feel like, you know, it just served them um, so well in never saying like, we're there, high five, now the hard work's done. Good teams talk about teamwork like they do the work work. (laughs) They realize this is something we have to continue to focus on and preserve. And that, you know, as, as things in the world change, as our competition changes, as Our employee base changes. We have to change and grow and flex as well. And, you know, I see them right now having taken an enormous hit with coronavirus where their business is basically done for the whole uh, ski season and foreseeable future. Um, You know, doing the right things, treating their employees well, working in the communities in the way that they should, um, because that you know that that's who they are did they make that an explicit rule for them to 
not talk behind each other's back or is that something that was just un, unwritten that it just became something that was very important to them? It was something they worked very hard on. And I would say it started with a belief in this from the CEO that he has this core belief um, in, you know, call it radical candor or whatever you want to call it, this core belief that we could all make each other better and we owe it to ourselves, our employees, our shareholders and our guests to be honest with each other at the top because a tweak at the top of the company can have an exponential impact on the on everyone else. And so if a leader is, you know, 5% more self-aware or a team is 10% more willing to to work harder to have the real conversation about a business decision um, or trade-offs on priorities or where resources should go, um, the the impact reverberates. And so they worked really hard. They gave each other live roundtable feedback at team sessions. We did 360s with them for uh, years and years. Um, we actually did a leadership program for this company uh, with high potential leaders. And the CEO came in every year and would say, okay, everyone in the room, here's your opportunity. Let's give the CEO feedback. And he would um, listen to people's feedback. So it was a cultural transformation that he wanted to create. And he knew it absolutely had to start with himself and hit the senior team. Very cool. No, that's that's a, a really interesting story there. Um, I'm conscious of time because I said we'd try and wrap at an hour, but we haven't touched. You mentioned coronavirus, and that has brought through so many new challenges that uh, this new world we're living in. And I, I guess, you know, from what we're seeing, it's not going to go away anytime soon. And probably fundamentally, it's going to change how people work for, for the long haul. Even when it goes, organizations might see, well, our productivity didn't get that damaged with people work from home why not continue doing it what are the things you're being asked of executives and leaders at the moment on how they can enable empower their teams to work better remotely is there anything coming up that uh, is very useful that you could share at this time um maybe maybe rebecca first to you there um we are the, the challenges of working remotely on a team um, are compounding because it's so much harder when you don't have that you know face to face the human contact. You always have to start by developing trust and the relationship, um, taking time to check in with people to uh, you know ensure that you're getting people's true feelings and concerns on the table, um, trying extra hard to assume positive intent. And, you know, especially during times of fear and anxiety, our, our stress related behaviors come out. And so a lot of it goes back to just kind of heightened self-awareness and taking time to understand how you're impacting each other. And certainly during a time of fear, what do people need from you um, to, to do our best work. I think, the, you know, the fear and the anxiety piece are heightened right now and having people able to do a little bit of talking and processing around that can very much help. Um, I'm going to bounce it to Audrey because she did just write an article on kind of some of these practices of virtual teaming. Is there anything you would add, Audrey, to what I just uh, started with? I think I would just add, uh, start with compassion. Um, you have to like connect and be compassionate right now. And um, I think if team leaders can remember that, it will gain them something in terms of how the team works together now and forever in terms of loyalty to each other and to the um, team leader. I th what I've been hearing a lot from team leaders is that team members are feeling anxious about missing out, um, that you don't have those com informal conversations that have happened around the office. And so they're nervous about people not including them. And so to me, um, over-communicate, 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 um, help 
people get engaged with each other. Make sure that if you're a team leader, you're asking, hey, have you included so-and-so in this conversation? Um, As a leader, I, I think more frequent, shorter communication is really important right now, whether it's like a daily check in of just how are you and what's on our plates for today and does everyone have everything we need? Um, or, you know, at least a couple times a, a week. Certainly seeing people on video is enormously more useful than. Um, phone conversations. Um, And I've seen many leaders who, you know, whether it's virtual happy hours, um, I have a team leader who's doing a contest with her team every week, like this week's was, you know, the best working from home meme. Um, You know, there's lots of ways to uh, try to engage people right now. But as Rebecca said, assume positive intent, assume everyone little bit or a lot stressed, you don't forget about their personal lives. I was talking to a team leader who one of her her team members has three little kids at home under five and a wife who's a nurse. Now you, you, you better start. and, And they were calling her their work environment was the closet. That's the only space they could find for a little bit of privacy If you don't have compassion as a leader right now for that situation, no one asked for this. They're not being lazy. They're not trying to shirk responsibilities. We can only do what we can do right now. Linda, have you anything to add to that? Um, So, and it is an ad. This is not um, uh, in place of or to start with. But I, I do think there's a pragmatic element that if we add to the things that Audrey and Rebecca have said, um, and it, it's around if if you have operating norms as a team right now, do they which of those still apply in a remote environment? If you don't have operating norms right now, you really should think about putting together a set of how are we going to engage with each other? What are the rules of engagement in this remote environment? Because I I find that um, unexpressed expectations that are violated are, are, are usually the breaking point in any relationship. And the cue there is their unexpressed expectations. So I would encourage leaders to work with their teams in what are those expectations? Are we going to have, to Audrey's point, are we going to have a daily check-in um, and have that be separate from business as usual? Um, just what are, um, if we're, we're talking about a remote team that may be in different parts of the country um, and we've never talked before, even different parts of the world, and we've never talked before about honouring time zones, is now the time to talk about it? So I, I, compassion first and foremost, um, it has to be there. And, and once you, you, you deal with this from a human perspective, what are some of the real pragmatic challenges we have working remotely? Let's put some guidelines around those. And, and then people you know, don't, drive off, don't drive off the road mm-hmm. and get in the ditch. <clears throat> very, very good to, to kind of end it on. But I have one final question to, to wrap up. Are you a loyalist team? Would you consider yourself a loyalist team? <laughs> and if, if uh, what are the maybe what is the one thing you have to collectively work on most to, to remain a loyalist team? Maybe uh, might be a good way to, to kind of end it. That, that's this is always my favorite question um, because it would be if we weren't, we wouldn't have much credibility in, in the work we do. Sometimes we, I know coaching, we, we, we're very good at coaching other people, but sometimes coaching ourselves can be the hardest part, right? So so the people that work closely with us are always amazed and um, I guess astounded that we have absolutely been able to take these principles and, and live by them. And to the points made earlier in the hour, um, it's not a final there's no final kind of resting point on this. It's an ongoing journey and it, it, there's hard work to be done around calling each other out, coaching each other, making space for when we're not at our very best. How do we help bring people along? Um, 
it's it's there are there are challenges with it and being having the commitment to wanting the team succeed so bad that you're or so so much that you're willing to have tough conversations um support each other in some pretty profound ways especially during tough times um all of those things that we know work for the best teams we certainly um continue to raise our own bar for how to make that live there's three touch points I would have about what makes us a loyalist team. Um, and I'll start off with a very pragmatic one to begin with. And that's our financial model. Yeah. Um, so unlike a lot of, of consulting partnerships, we we split everything three ways. So no matter who brings in the work, no matter who delivers it, no matter what the costs are, um, we split that three ways. And that's been how we've worked with with this from from the very beginning. The second thing is that I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that my partners absolutely have my back. So I had a a personal situation recently where I had um, an unexpected surgery that I had to um, go in for. And it didn't take me a second to call out to Audrey or Rebecca to say, I have this client engagement um, after my surgery that I cannot make. Um, Can one of you take it? And, and Rebecca, who has her leg in a cast right now, <laughs> who, 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 who runs through the airport on a scooter or who ran through the airport on a scooter because she doesn't fly anymore, um, was like, sure, I'll take this on. And I had not a moment's hesitation that she would do an amazing job. And I had not a moment's hesitation in handing it off to the client who I had just began work with and I got a call back from the client later telling me just what an incredible job Rebecca did. So I, I know that they always have my back um, and I have no hesitation in, in reaching out to them. And then the part I don't like but is really real is when I get the phone call um, and I will say that it's the phone call from Audrey more than Rebecca that gets my heart going where Audrey is like, Linda, i um, I have some feedback for you. I'm like, oh, jeez. <laughs> but um, it, it is always there. And I know that the intent is for me to shine and me to be my best self and me to bring forward my best work. Um, and we do that with each other. Um, we, we do that with each other whenever the opportunity presents itself. Right. Shining examples there. Brilliant. Thanks for, for sharing that. Linda, Audrey, do you, do you want to say anything to, to wrap it? I I don't think I have anything else to, to add to that. I just, um, I, maybe it goes back to your intuitive question, but I like, I know in my heart that we have unconditional trust. What, what they give to me is not conditioned by um, anything that I do or don't do over the course of the day. And it really is built on this um, belief that they have um, that they owe it to me and to us to make me better. And um, it is, I, there is, I wouldn't give it up for like the best corporate job in the whole world. I, I could never imagine a better working situation than getting to work for 12 years as part of a loyalist team. Brilliant. That's a, a ringing endorsement, Audrey. Thanks for sharing that. So Audrey Epstein, Linda Adams, Rebecca Teelsdale, thanks so much for sharing your your journey as well as the thoughts about the book, The Loyalist Team, which uh, maybe let us know how folks can get the book and just give a call out to your uh, website, how people can get in touch. So the book can be purchased um, from most on, or from all online retailers. Amazon.com um, clearly is one. Um, I would suggest we've had an issue with the site recently where it shows up as one book available. Um, though there's lots of books available, just click down to other resellers. Um, uh, so that's one place to get the book. And then our website is trispectivegroup.com. You can link to the book through that. Uh, you can find the assessments on that website and you can read more about us in terms of our background um, on that website also and our offerings. Thanks so much for sharing that. I uh, look forward to sharing this out with my listeners as well. I really enjoyed uh, talking with all three of you. I think we got through it pretty well. Um, (laughs) 
you know, I'm learning to call out names a bit better the next time round. But uh, it was a pleasure to talk to the three of you today. Thanks so much. And uh, as I said, yeah, hopefully we'll stay in touch. Well, That's thanks great. for the invitation. Thank, Thank you, you. so much. And have a great weekend. You too, guys. Have a great weekend. Take care. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Hey folks, thanks so much for listening to the show. If you enjoyed it, could you please consider helping me extend the reach of the podcast that a little bit further? You can do that in a number of ways. The number one way is to subscribe on your app of choice. This helps me with the chart ranking, leading to more folks stumbling across the podcast and checking it out. You could also repost it on your social media channels. Any of them would be great. And maybe even tell a friend in person or over the phone. Pick up the phone, give them a call and tell them about the 1% Better podcast. Tell them about this episode or one that you've heard in the past. And he will do. I would really appreciate it. In the last year, we set up a 1% Better Slack community, which you can join for free. And interact with me and other members of the community and improve through holding each other accountable and sharing monthly challenges. It's a lot of fun. Check it out. I'm into season four of this incredible journey and the more of these interviews and solo shows that I research, record and share, the better I believe that they get and more loaded with actionable takeaways that you can learn from. I know I've learned so much from it so far, and it's always really, really fulfilling and rewarding when I hear from you on what you took from it. So do reach out, rob at robofthegreen.ie. And of everybody that listens, 90% listen and enjoy, but only around 10% actually take action, write down takeaways and put them into practice. I am convinced that if we can move that number a bit higher, the listeners will not only make steps forward towards their goals, but they will be more fulfilled and happy and better. Change doesn't happen overnight. It is hard, but it's all about taking the first step, whatever that is for you. You can absolutely do this. Make a plan, be deliberate, take action. Don't overreach. Start with those small incremental improvements and over time you will see great progress. It's all in the pursuit of betterness. So again, thank you so much for listening. Good luck and stay safe.